Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. So this is our last video, the last chapter of Watsuji Tetsuro's Ethics, uh, chapter 14. And the, this chapter is titled The Good and Bad of Ningen, Guilt and Conscience. So I've broken the video down into two parts. We'll look at good and bad first, and then guilt and conscience second. So let's hit that first section, good and bad. Now, given what we said in the last chapter, chapter 13, about truthfulness, where truthfulness meant um, not so much the act of telling the truth or being honest, but truthfulness as uh, like the truth of what it is to be a human being, grounded in that fundamental nature that Watsuji identified, which is essentially uh, that spatio-temporal in-betweenness. Um, so acts of practical interconnectedness, that's kind of, and, and the double negation, that's, that's where all of, um, that, that's where truthfulness gra is grounded for Watsuji. So what we said in the last chapter about truthfulness tells us that goodness essentially consists of the occurrence of the truthfulness of Ningen Sonzai and hence those activities of Ningen performed in compliance with truthfulness. So the, essentially the full realization of human beings, that's what truthfulness is. Um, and badness then, and we, earlier we called that authenticity quite a while ago. Uh, when we, once we identified that fundamental nature, we called that uh, acting in accord with that, acting in such a way that it is um, facilitated in others and in, in oneself. That is authenticity. So badness is just preventing this truthfulness from occurring, preventing or obstructing or covering over the truthfulness of Ningen Sonzai, what it is to be a human being as that, um, that double negation grounded in, in betweenness. So that's good and bad. That's what goodness and badness are. And I just want to clarify one thing. A while ago, um, I, I have no idea how many videos back it was, but somewhere near the middle, I we talked about um, this. Something simple. We talk, actually, where we talked about authenticity, I, I didn't like Watsuji's characterization of goodness there. Uh, at that time, he said... Good and bad were only found in acts, characters, and personalities, etc., um, i.e. things found in people. That was where we had to look for goodness and badness. Therefore, um, we had to look to what it is that makes people people to identify the good and the bad. Since goodness and badness are only found in things that belong to people, we had to look at people themselves, human nature, to understand goodness and badness. And this meant looking at Watsuji's fundamental law, uh, which was that act of double negation. And so there we said the, the first negation, where we go from um, emptiness to the individual, that was bad negating the community and then the second negation where we negated the individual and came back to community was goodness and that second negation was good because it was a return to the foundation it was a return to the original our our kind of metaphysical truth if you like and there i i disagreed with that i didn't like that that idea that just because it's it's the starting point that we ought to return to it i don't i didn't think that that had uh, moral worth and i still don't um just because it's it's where we where we started the point where we started from i don't think you can get to ought from there i don't think you can get a moral imperative out of that but things have changed a little bit now um the, the, the kind of result is the same, but for different reasons. 
And so what I think does get you to ought is the insight that human beings are fundamentally, necessarily, this double negation, which we've called truthfulness. Right? It's not that that's where we started from, therefore we have to get back to it. It's just that that is what it is to be a human being. And so even if we lie, cheat and steal, we are still this double negation. We're still grounded in the spatio-temporal in-betweenness. We're still fundamentally part of a community. And in that sense, um, it makes sense, I think, in that sense it makes sense to say that we ought not to obstruct this or cover that over. We ought to, for want of a better word, we ought to honor that. We ought to uh, recognize it and facilitate it in others and in ourselves. And so I think that that is a better reason for um, grounding goodness and badness in the fundamental nature of human beings. And so that, anyway, I just wanted to um, highlight that I disagreed with, with this earlier on. But the reason was um, we were grounding it in this this notion of, of kind of uh, a return to the original. The original was somehow, uh, the original starting point of human beings was somehow metaphysically um, preferable or, or better in some sense. And so we had to get back to it. That, I think, is, is not, it doesn't get you to any kind of moral, um, principle. Whereas this, the, just the fact of what it is to be a human being, even if we act terribly, we, we still are this, this fundamental nature. We still are this double negation grounded in in-betweenness. Uh, and that, I think, does um, imply that we ought to act in such a way that we respect that, that we acknowledge it, that we work towards um, preserving and, and making that, that, that fundamental nature, um, bringing it out into the open, making it, 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 allowing that process to take place. Okay, I think I've, I think I've belabored that point enough. Just try, I, sometimes I just try and think of different ways to say the same thing. I don't know if that helps. Um, I, I think it might, maybe, just trying to come at the same point from different different directions, that using different words, and, and maybe um, one of those expressions is clearer than the others for you, and maybe for someone else it'll be a different expression, but I think that's why I do that. I, I think so. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, good. So that's goodness and badness. And this is another thing that, that just going back to something we said earlier, uh, actually, in that same in that same video where we talked about authenticity and um, and badness being that first negation, goodness being the second negation, at that point we said that the first negation was bad, negating the community to get to the individual. Um, but we also noticed that it was because it was a necessary part of the process. To come back to the to the um, to community, it can't be completely bad, right? It must actually be good. You have to go through that and through the the, the first negation in order to enact the second negation. So it had to be, even though it appeared as if it was bad, um, we th we kind of thought it was, in actuality, good as a part of the whole process. And I said there that Watsuji would reverse this, but I realize now that wasn't quite right. He doesn't reverse it. What he does say, though, is that this first negation, the, um, the first negation of community, where we, where we are um, individualizing ourselves, where we're, we're rejecting the community to make ourselves an individual, that is not yet by itself a revolting against the whole. It's not yet a turning against the whole because it's still a part of that process, right? It's still still working through 
<clears throat> what will be, or working up to what will be that second negation. Um, so I, it's still good. It's still a part of the, that, of goodness. However, it's when individualization loses sight of the movement of coming back that pierces it through and through. That is when the, the first negation becomes a revolting against trust itself, becomes a, um, a turning against this movement back to community. <clears throat> and that is bad. Because in this case, the movement of coming back has been halted, has been stopped, obstructed. That movement is no longer taking place. And that we've defined as bad when, when trust, truthfulness is obstructed, is covered over, is, um, okay, that's enough, <laughs> obstructed or covering, covered over. Uh, so the, the, just to sum up that little, little, um, section, the first negation in itself, in itself isn't bad. It's just a part of the process. It's, it's, it's a necessary first step getting towards the second negation. But when it loses sight of the full arc of the movement and becomes then an obstruction of trust and truthfulness, then it's bad. So it's, it's more, he doesn't, he definitely doesn't reverse what he said earlier or we noticed what we noticed earlier. He just, um, clarifies it, I guess, just extends it a little bit in light of what we've, what we've looked at regarding trust and truthfulness. Okay. Then he talks about loyalty for a little bit. And this is, um, it kind of follows naturally, right? Given the centrality of truthfulness as, as the truth of a human being, what it is to be a human being, and how important relationships with others in betweenness are for this, then loyalty is important for Watsuji. Loyalty, loyalty is, is also central because we're dealing with acts of practical interconnectedness. That, that's what in-betweenness is, right? And that's what, what uh, Watsuji's ethics is grounded in. So loyalty is foundational here. Um, so he says, truthfulness occurs in human activities by the way one responds to trust. The way one responds to trust, to that, that um, recognition that this other person is someone I can have a trust relationship with. The way one responds to that is central to this whole ethical project. So the key trait for that, the way one responds to trust, is loyalty. And in fact, he says, loyalty is goodness. He goes so far as to say that loyalty as in a facilitating of this double negation. Um, and allowing this spatio-temporal in-betweenness to arise, to emerge, that is goodness. However, loyalty only ever arises with, at the same time, with the potential for betrayal. One could not speak of loyalty um, if other people were compelled to preserve the trust relationship, if there was some kind of coercive force then you can't talk of loyalty anymore, right? There's no, if someone's made to do, to behave in a certain way, there's no loyalty, there's no trust there. However, this doesn't mean that goodness, we ought to think that goodness is contaminated by badness in some way. On the contrary, he says, goodness is the ground for badness. Goodness is, has a kind of priority here. It's, it's the original um, move. It's the original starting point here. Uh, badness is derived from it. In the same way that we saw in the last video, falsehood was only possible on the ground of truthfulness. So it is here betrayal is rendered 
on the ground of trust and badness only on the ground of goodness. So that's what he has to say about loyalty. And uh, if we just keep moving down, I think. I really like this next little um, section, the impossibility of having fixed moral rules or moral formulae to which which can be applied to kind of figure out the correct thing to do. Given that goodness must be understood in terms of trust relationships and trust relationships all vary, the question of what kind of act is good and what kind is bad varies accordingly as well. To separate acts from a concrete trust relationship and to pinpoint goodness or badness only by means of external prescription is merely a pharisaic fixation. Nice, nice. And we, we have kind of talked about this before, right at the beginning. I remember talking about this a little bit, but love this idea. Um, Watsuji is not giving rules, uh, as in like a deontological system. He's not giving formulae like utilitarianism, acts so that you maximize happiness or anything like that. Um, I call those kinds of theories morality for dummies. Just you don't have to, you don't actually have to do any 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 ethics, right? You don't have to know anything about ethics, even you don't you don't even have to want to know anything about ethics. You don't even have to want to do the right thing. Just follow the rule. Just apply the principle. Apply the maxim. Apply the formula, uh, and then you, you're good to go. You don't have to have any kind of investment in what you're doing and um so yeah watsuji's not going in that direction you'll notice we haven't he hasn't told us how to behave he hasn't given us any rules he hasn't even hasn't even given us um anything to maximize a value to to pursue to try and obtain um which, which is good, I think. I don't think morality should boil down to these kinds of simplistic um, approaches. That's the first thing. I don't think morality shouldn't reduce to those. You, you lose, I think, whatever it is, what it is that makes an ethical act ethical if you're just following rules or you're just applying formulae. Um, and on top of that, I don't think those things help in actual ethical dilemmas, right? Think about, for example, think about abortion. Um, deontology. Well, what is deontology? What, what does any kind of rule-based, uh, any kind of, yeah, moral rule-based ethics tell us about abortion? Nothing, right? The closest you get is don't kill. But that, that's the whole problem with abortion. That's what, why it is such a moral sticking point, because is it, is it murder to kill, to kill, right? Is it murder to eliminate, to dispense, dispose of an unborn fetus, which at, 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 until some certain point is just a collection of cells? Is that, at what point does it become do those cells become a human being? Is it from the moment of conception? Is it is it part of the way? Is it is it you know at what point do we do we consider this murder? Deontology doesn't help us with that, nor does utilitarianism. This maxim, maximize happiness. Whose happiness? The fetus's happiness. It, it, can the fetus be happy? Do we or do we factor into? into this into our considerations that it might be happy later it will be happy after it's grown up does that does that weigh in on our decision what about the happiness of the parents the families family members you know there's just these kinds of of um approaches these morality for dummies approaches they sound good when you think of the the, the easy questions you know should we kill no you get an easy answer but we already know that. We already know the answer to that. Should we steal? No. You can ease, you can, you know, those are easy, kind of the, the low hanging fruit. But it's when you get to the, when the rubber hits the road that you realize these things don't actually help. These, these um, ethical systems, they don't actually help when it gets to sticky 
ethical dilemmas. Uh, you need something more flexible. And, uh, and so that, that's one of the reasons why I think any morality will not reduce, any, any morality worth the name won't reduce to a simplistic kind of a, a set of rules or commandments or a, a formula that you can just apply in any situation. There has to be more flexibility, more, and you, you, you know, you have to think about it. There's no way to avoid that. You have to engage yourself. You have to, you have to uh, work your ethical muscle a little bit to get the answer. Uh, and it may not even, there may not even be an answer. That's the thing that that's part of what ethics is. But these kinds of simplistic approaches they cover over this, they, they miss this, they try and make it foolproof. But, um, but you can't do that, I think, with, with morality. Interestingly enough, virtue ethics ticks a lot of the same boxes as what Suji does. One of the, the, the biggest problem, I think, or the biggest difference is that Aristotle believed the function or the purpose of human beings was rational thought. So that's, that's kind of his fundamental nature. Whereas for Watsuji, it was that double negation, grounded in in-betweenness, community. That was, that was kind of the central idea. Um, so there, and that, that is a big difference, actually. But apart from that, the kind of, the kind of, the guiding kind of principle, the guiding idea behind virtue ethics is this, is the same, actually, as, as Watsuji's. Um, yeah, but that, from that, uh, quote, I think that's, that's the main thing I wanted to highlight was that Watsuji doesn't give a set of rules. He doesn't give a formula. He just gives a principle. And from that, we have to, we, we carry that principle with us into our ethical, um, decision-making. The principle is that goodness must be understood in terms of trust relationships and trust relationships are grounded in the fundamental nature of human beings, which is um, the double negation and that in-betweenness. It all comes back to that for Watsuji. So if you work from that, it's flexible enough to let you um, approach those real moral dilemmas with some, with something that that can handle them, or something that's flexible enough to to deal with with these kinds of problems. I think. All right, then he goes on to talk about morality and history. Interestingly enough, Watsuji claims that his central principle has actually been upheld in moral systems of all societies throughout history. Um, and so if we think about the, some of the overlapping moral tenets, say, of Christianity and Buddhism, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't deceive, they've always been wrong, Watsuji claims, because they all prohibit the betrayal of a human being. They all... Um, honor this notion of truthfulness that Watsuji's identified here. Truthfulness not as in telling the truth, honesty, but truthfulness as in the truth of what it is to be a human being. That fundamental nature of human being grounded in in-betweenness. Um, so, and the, given that they all prohibit the betrayal of human being, this is entirely in accordance with Watsuji's principle of trust relationships being the ground of or being forming our um, ethical core. But there's a, an obvious objection, right? Societies have permitted all of these things at various times in history. So then <clears throat> the objection would say there's no underlying universal sentiment such as Watsuji's principle. So regarding homicide, um, some instances where this has been permitted, uh, revenge killing and human sacrifice. Regarding adultery, 
Watsuji talks about polygamy being permitted. And regarding theft and deception, he goes back to the ancient Greeks and their the way that their gods kind of acted. They took whatever they wanted, they lied, they 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 stole, they did kind of all of the bad things. But but these were the, the exemplars of um, the Greek of Greek religion. Um, and so and so there's kind of, there's kind of a moral um, permissibility, at least at the level of Greek gods. However, Watsuji says that correctly, I think, the essence of these acts cannot be understood objectively. So when we're talking about homicide, murder, that's not depriving a person of their life in a biological or a physiological sense. Rather, it deprives the person who has the capacity for membership in a specific society of all of his or her existence. And this has always been wrong. So homicide is, murder is not just taking a life. It is taking a life, it, it's, it's um, cutting off the possibility for someone to enjoy membership in a specific society, to enjoy um, the full benefits of, it's a funny way to put it, the full benefits of existence as being part of this community, to, to fully um, appreciate and enjoy their, their life as a human being. Um, and so then if we think about things like revenge, killing, and human sacrifice, these acts aren't carried out against people considered as people with whom one could have a trust relationship. So a revenge killing, that person has already violated the, uh, the trust relationship. They've already taken themselves out of uh, the kind of ethical sphere. And so now to kill them is no longer to kill someone, is no longer to, to um, betray a trust relationship because that trust relationship has already been betrayed. So that, that they've kind of voluntarily, by doing whatever it was that they did, they've taken themselves out of this, this ethical circle. They're no longer a part of it. So that there's no longer a trust relationship to preserve to maintain, um, and so taking their lives is not is not murder. The same with um, human sacrifice, and kind of in the opposite direction, maybe. So that a, the sacrifice of a human to a god, for example, is that person is no longer a part of the community. They're not they're not just a human being anymore. They're that they've been kind of selected, maybe that there's an, an an air or an aura of maybe divinity about them. That that they've they've got one foot beyond human existence. So that in a sense they're above this trust relationship. They're above the the um, possibility for having for forming a trust relationship. And so again. To, to take that person's life in, in a kind of a ritual manner is not is not ending is not is not, is not um, depriving a person who has the capacity for membership in a society of their existence. It's, it's no longer that. And so Watsuji's principle applies there. Of course, this is not justifying those actions. It's not saying that they're right. It's just saying that. When we have permitted killing, we've done it in such a way that the trust relationship that Watsuji is talking about is still intact because those people who, whom it was permitted to kill stand outside that the possibility of a trust relationship. And that's obviously a completely... Um, a crazy way of thinking about it, right? It's, it's a terrible way of thinking about people, reducing them to maybe less than human or more than human, and then so they're not they're not related, or that that we have no ethical obligations to them. 
it's a terrible way of thinking about it, but it's how we did. It's how people did think about that in order to justify killing. Um, so those people, those societies where these kinds of acts were permitted didn't violate Watsuji's principles. They didn't violate this, um, this notion that goodness must be understood in terms of trust relationships, that it's grounded in, um, in betweenness. It's grounded in that, that double negation. Um, so I quite like that. I think, and I think he's, he's onto something there, actually. These things, that, that violation of that, of that trust relationship has always been wrong. And even though we've, we've, uh, we've permitted various degrees of, um, violence or, or criminality, uh, when it, wherever we have done so, it's in such a way that, 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 the trust relationship hasn't been violated. It's it, it's still been um, accorded the centrality that it deserves as a moral principle for, as Watsuji claims. So I've got a, a little quote to finish this section for you. The view that the standard of goodness and badness differs in accordance with time and place is obviously false. What differs here has something to do with the extent of the trust relationship and the manner of its expression, not with the principle according to which a response to trust is good and a betrayal of trust bad. This principle has not been subject to any change throughout all societies, ranging from the most primitive to the most civilized. Nice. Okay, so let's head into the second section, guilt and conscience. So guilt, there isn't a huge amount to say about guilt here. Um, at least I'm going to make it very short. Guilt just means having a sense of indebtedness. And this can only arise from the awareness of badness. That is in the consciousness of a betrayal of trust. So when we feel guilt, he's <clears throat> basically what Watsuji is doing is just tying guilt into his fundamental principle here. Guilt is arises from the consciousness of having betrayed trust in some way. So it connects back to his, his fundamental ethical principle. Conscience. Um, regarding conscience, we have talked about this before, very briefly, where we said that it was always negative. And the point at that time, was to link conscience with the fundamental nature of human beings, which was that double negation. So um, that was what we, what we said about conscience the, earlier on. This is basically just a deeper examination. And Watsuji says there are three aspects to consciousness, to, to conscience. The first is it's always concerned with one's own acts. So it always arises as an accusation or a prick, he says, directed to our own acts from inside ourselves in some manner through which we have practical interconnection with others. So it's always connected with one's, uh, one's acts. And if you remember um, in the last video, I think it was chapter 12, at the, at the beginning of the video, we talked about acts, what it is to be, what an act is for Watsuji, and it's always something concerning others. <clears throat> so when he says conscience is always concerned with one's own acts, he means within or with respect to other people. Um, so it comes from inside and it's related to our actions as far as other people go. Secondly, it can only arise in as much as we are consciously aware that the acts in consideration are bad. So conscience only comes about when we are um, in, in full recognition, in full understanding of what it is to be a human being, of this, this notion that even maybe it's not full recognition, but, th but there's a um, can only come about through acknowledging at some level 
this fundamental nature of human beings that Watsuti's pointed out here, in-betweenness, the double negation, the trust relationship. Um, and so whenever it arises, whenever conscience arises, it's because at some level we are aware that there is there is possibility of or or there is a possibility of betraying trust or if it's about an act that has already happened um, trust has been betrayed in some way so there at some level it may, it may not be full conscious awareness but at some level there is an awareness of this this um, this this notion that the acts we're thinking about are bad they've, they've betrayed trust in some way and the third point is that in conscience, the accuser and the accused stand in opposition to each other. The accused is the acting I, but what Suji asks, who is the accuser? The accuser may appear to be the mind, the ideal ego, God, the public or the state. But what Suji's point is that no matter who we feel the accusation to be coming from, the accusing voice is always heard from the bottom of the self's heart. And that's the main idea here. Conscience is always from oneself. Even if, uh, you know, even if it's been kind of, you might think you've been conditioned by society or your parents or your, your peer group or whatever, or God or whoever it is that you think is, is um, responsible ultimately for your your pangs of conscience. That voice is still coming from within you, irrespective of how how that voice got there, if you like, irrespective of why you think that, why you th you your conscience is is um, responding in the situation. The fact is that it, it's always experienced as coming from within. It's not an externally imposed um, voice is, is the point. For this reason, we need to look for the source of the accusing voice in the origin of Ningen Sonzai. Whether we regard the source as I or God or society, these are all mere interpretations concerning the origin of Ningen Sonzai. And here, we've kind of gone back to, <clears throat> excuse me, we've gone back to what we talked about in the in the earlier video on conscience, back to Ningen Sonzai and its fundamental nature is negativity. And I still kind of don't like this. It's still, um, it's, it's, it's just trying to link conscience to some kind of metaphysical you know, um, absolute negation, I think, which I think is, that's one aspect of this that I don't, I don't like. Um, however, I do like the fact that Watsuji says conscience always comes from oneself, comes from the bottom of one's, of the self's heart. I just don't think there's a metaphysical link to be made there. And I don't think it has anything to do with the, the, the double negation, you know, despite the fact that, that, Conscience is always negative. It's always, uh, it, it tells us what not to do or something that gives us a warning or, you know, it's always negative in some way. I don't think there's a connection to be made there to those double negations that we talked about. Um, so, yeah. Finally, Watsuti says there are two ways to ignore the voice of conscience. The first is actively by persuasion. So in this case, we build up theories defending our own acts against the complaint of an accusing voice and search for agreement with a third party. So we <clears throat> yeah, just try and, and, and justify our acts, right? That's how we, one way of, of overcoming or attempting to ignore conscience. And the other is passively by simply employing self-deception to lull the voice to sleep. So that's another probably way that you are uh, a way that you're probably fairly familiar with we all are at times just distracting ourselves maybe or just you know focusing on something else turning our attention to something else um, in some way 
in some manner employing self-deception to to render that voice of conscience less um, pressing. All right, nice. Let's hit a summary. So first up, we looked at good and bad. The main thing I think here was the principle of goodness, which is that goodness is essentially trust relationships grounded in our fundamental nature. That fundamental nature being that that double negation, the movement of that double negation and in-betweenness. Um, so connecting us to community, essentially, fundamentally. Then we looked at loyalty. And loyalty, because the trust relationship is so important for Watsuji's ethics, loyalty is um, important in the way we respond to that trust. So important that Watsuji says loyalty is goodness. Uh, then we looked at the impossibility of fixed rules or formulae. So things like de deontology and utilitarianism, they don't really offer genuine moral, um, they don't offer genuine solid moral systems, I think. They do give moral guidance, but only, like I said, for the, for the obvious things. When you get to the more more difficult problems that we face in uh, in our ethical lives, they, they, they tend to break down and we end up just um, using them to justify whatever it is that we want, I think. Um, which is not necessarily bad because we, our, our uh, moral inclinations may be on the right track, but you're kind of doing morality without realizing what you're doing in that sense. You're not applying deontology and utilitarianism so much as um, justifying the answer with them. Um, so you're kind of doing ethics unconsciously, in a way. Although we did look at virtue ethics, which, which was quite close to, and certainly I think the, the, the general idea underneath virtue ethics is the same as Watsuji's, that, that idea that we're looking at, at the, the person, him or herself, what it is to be a human being. We're going straight to that and, and basing our ethics on that. Um, so that, that had a lot of overlap. Finally, we moved on to Watsuji's principle, seeing that Watsuji's principle was a universal standard throughout history. All societies have, ad have adhered to Watsuji's principle, even when they've permitted acts that, that would, on the surface, violate his principle. There's always, that's always been a guiding um, intuition in all of our, in all of society's um, ethics. Then we looked at guilt, and basically we just got a definition here. Guilt is a sense of indebtedness arising from the awareness of badness. So consciousness of a betrayal of trust. That's what leads to guilt. And we looked at conscience as well. And there were three aspects to this. The first was conscience is always concerned with one's own acts. That is to say, it's, a, it's always an accusation related to practical interconnection with others. The second thing, it was a conscience is all, it always involves a conscious awareness that the acts are bad, that there has been a violation or betrayal of trust. Conscience, conscious awareness may be over, overstating it, but there, at, there is at some level an acknowledgement that that's what, that's what gives rise to that prick of conscience. And finally, Conscience always arises from the self. It always comes from within, irrespective of how you know, you've been, your moral conditioning, if you like, or your upbringing. Conscience always comes from you. And finally, we looked at two ways to ignore conscience. The first was actively through persuasion, a kind of justifying of, of your actions. And the second was passively through self-deception or... Um, Distraction, just just moving on, just just nullifying the the um, 
accusation of conscience in some way. Okay, that is Watsuti's Ethics. I really like this book. I think there's, um, I, don't, I don't agree with everything in it, but I agree with the, the overall arc, I think. And uh, I think, yeah, this is, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about ethics or morality, but um, basically because I haven't been that satisfied with, with any of the approaches that are out there. But this, I think, is something, it's essentially what maybe Heideggerian, a Heideggerian ethical system would look like if if Heidegger had kind of followed it through in the, in the same way. But it's very much springs out of um, Heidegger's philosophy. And um, yeah, I think it's 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 a good book to read and a good um, a good idea to take on board. Anyway, let me stop rambling. I'm going to take a couple of weeks off, I think. Um, just because I'm not quite ready for the next series. But I have decided it's I'm going to go on to um, Difference in Repetition by, um, what's his name? Deleuze. So, and I, I just haven't quite finished my summary of his of that book yet. So I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks honing that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll get into difference and repetition then anyway thanks for listening to this series i hope it helped in some way and um i'll catch you in the next one see you then